and welcome to another installment of Hungry for History. I'm Luciana Spreaker with the City of Savannah's Municipal Archives. I'm here today with Jeffrey Offgang, who will present on Jim Crow in Savannah's parks. Mr. Offgang is a retired career journalist who has worked with radio and television at organizations including CNN, CBS News, and Radio Free Europe. Jeff has lived in Georgia for 28 years and headed the news department at WMAZ-TV in Macon for 10 years. In his retirement, he has turned his attention to diving into the world of history, earning an MA in history and a graduate certificate in public history, both from Georgia Southern University. Through Georgia Southern, Jeff worked with the Municipal Archives to examine our collections as part of his graduate thesis and public project, Jim Crow in Savannah's Park. And we've invited him to share his work with you today. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jeff. Thank you. Savannah had a well-deserved reputation in the Jim Crow era as more progressive on race than other Southern cities. It mostly avoided the violent reaction to integration elsewhere in the South, but many Savannians suffered and can still remember suffering under Jim Crow discrimination until the civil rights era of the 1960s. And that includes in the matter of parks. From Reconstruction until 1964, the city of Savannah operated separate park systems for white and black citizens. The decisions by the city council and the Park and Tree Commission and other agencies helped keep black people out of Savannah's premier parks and squares. Black taxpayers were financing a superior park system for whites. The division was not laid down by law directly because society understood the rules. This was a prime example of customary segregation in the era of Jim Crow. Documents we'll see in the, from the City of Savannah Municipal Archives show how city government extended the customs of racist practices in public accommodations such as stores and restaurants to public parks and recreation. In, 19, in rather in 2020, the director of the Savannah Municipal Archives, Luciana Spraker, published a study on racism in Savannah's showcase parks, Forsyth and Daffin. I interned at the Municipal Archives and continued this research to include segregation at other parks, playgrounds, swimming pools, and Laurel Grove Cemetery. Jim Crow segregation was a white backlash to the abolition of slavery. Whites in power sought other ways to control black people. Soon after the Civil War, the city council voted to close all but two gates of Forsyth Park to keep black people out. Police stationed at the gates prevented blacks from entering unless they accompanied children in their care. That was a common exception to customary segregation. This stereoscopic image of an African-American woman with a baby carriage in Forsyth Park is believed to date from the 1880s. The army controlled Savannah right after the Civil War and objected to keeping black people out of Forsyth Park. So the council temporarily closed the park completely to everyone. City authorities then turned to passing vague statutes that could be selectively enforced against black people. This provision enacted in 1866 remained law until at least 1945. It threatened arrest for indecent, riotous, or disorderly conduct, offensive demeanor, or indecent or improper language in Forsyth Park. There's no mention of race here, but police enforced this law to keep black people out of the park. Segregation in fact, or de facto segregation, in Forsyth Park and in Daffin Park, open, which opened in 1907. And here's another example. This ordinance from the early 20th century, still in effect in 1958, banned loafing or loitering, even in restaurants and pool rooms, and it made it illegal to linger on the streets while unemployed. Until civil rights legislation in the 1960s, the black parks were smaller and poorly equipped compared to uh, parks in white neighborhoods. The black parks, the 
so-called black parks were on the east and west sides of town while the parks for white people were in the central part of the city. In those days, the Park and Tree Commission controlled the municipal parks. The superintendent uh, for many years, William Robertson, enforced the rules. He was, in effect, the police chief of the parks. The commission decided which parks and squares children could play in. Robertson and the commission saw park benches as a problem when black residents sat in parks in white neighborhoods. White residents would sometimes petition the commission to remove benches from their neighborhood park. This petition in 1935 claims black people sitting on the benches have made the situation undesirable and unsafe in Grayson Park. The commission votes and agrees to remove the concrete benches from the park. And the commissioner even wrote a follow-up letter to the lead petitioner assuring that action was being taken quickly. In June 1935, the park superintendent asked the city attorney, Shelby Myrick, whether police could bar black people from entering public parks in white neighborhoods altogether. In a reply by letter, which you see here, the city attorney sounds surprised. After all, he noted, black residents are citizens and many of them pay taxes. But Myrick thought that police could be quietly encouraged specifically to keep blacks off the benches. He understood that this was provocative and probably illegal. Myrick says this is a matter that should not reach the public prints and public agitation of this matter must be scrupulously avoided. Obviously, his advice did become public. This kind of discussion was still going on in 1961. I found this memo in the files of W.W. Law, the longtime NAACP president. These were possibly notes from a telephone conversation. Law writes, white citizens complained about the playground in Wells Park, which was used mostly by blacks. It was located a block east of West Broad Street. All equipment removed shortly thereafter and has not been replaced. Retired Negro League ball player Russell Patterson said that growing up in Savannah, he rarely stepped in Forsyth Park or Daffin Park because of customary segregation. Watch this video of Patterson's recollections from an interview by a member of my graduate cohort, Benjamin Botham, for his project on the history of African Americans in baseball in Savannah. Every now and then a lady on Abercorn used to, uh, I worked on Bonnet and then Gaston, and she used to order grocery and I used to ride my bike out there. That's the only reason the cops didn't bother me. And the same thing while I was standing by uh, Fullside Park, you know, mm -hmm. they had one, two, they had about eight teams, out, eight fields. And during that time, the American Legion was really the American Legion in Savannah. And I used to come through there, deliver my stuff, <clears throat> come through by the fountain, come in the back and look at that one field. Number one was the best field there. And I used to stand there and look and wonder we had a young white kid. He didn't know nothing about no racism. You know, he said, you know, come on out here. Could you play? I said, yeah, I got my gloves here. <clears throat> so I was just running the balls down. And the coach looked at me and he called me. I said, oh, God, now they're going to run me off the field. You know, he told me to my face. He said, you know, if I can paint your face white, you'll be my center field. And that's why I found out. I said, boy, this is something else. You know, but you, we couldn't play in Forsyth Park. And I know them kids on the leading team could not play me. I know that the same guy, Hawk Harrison, Ken Harrison, I used to chase balls with him out there by Daphne Park. That's the only time I stayed out Daphne Park. Yeah, you did not, I'm telling you, you did not hang in Daphne Park. It's just if you wanted to go to jail. So, one of the few instances of explicit racial segregation in Savannah's laws involved roller skating. In this section of the 1945 city codes, whites were permitted to roller skate downtown along Oglethorpe Avenue, the broad boulevard in downtown Savannah, and in Forsyth and Daffin Park. 
but blacks were limited to fewer locations in predominantly black neighborhoods. Discrimination extended to development of Savannah's playground system. The progressive administration of Mayor Richard Devant opened the city's first five playgrounds in June 1914, but none expressly for black children, even though city officials viewed playgrounds as a way to keep teenagers out of trouble and uh, give them a safer place to play. The Black Weekly, the Savannah Tribune, in this editorial, said black youth needed playgrounds more than anyone else because segregation limited their opportunities for recreation. This editorial said, not a single playground has been provided for our children. Even the city playground director urged the opening of a playground for black children. Finally, a private black organization, the Urban League, built and opened a playground on the east side. More than 500 children enjoyed the playground on opening days. We see here in this newspaper article, the park opened on Huntington Street between East Broad and Price. In 1917, the city agreed to fund and equip the park, but the Urban League continued to operate it. In 1932, the Recreation Commission reported that it operated seven full-time playgrounds for white children, but only two for black children. Another playground served black children 11 months of the year and another for nine months. There was no explanation of the discrepancy in the service between black and white playgrounds. Now for comparison, here's a schedule from the current day of supervised playground programs in all neighborhoods in Savannah. Since the big parks were whites only, Blacks in Savannah might take a steamer cruise to Hilton Head or Fernandina for a day-long outing. A streetcar company saw an opportunity to offer recreation closer to home. The Savannah Thunderbolt and Isle of Hope Railway Company financed and built Lincoln Park along its trolley line in the West End. The park opened in April 1900. So-called streetcar parks for Blacks were common in the segregated South. Streetcar companies and railroads built resorts for black people on the outskirts of cities, reachable mainly on their streetcars. This helped build passenger numbers, especially on Sundays. Here is an advertisement from the Savannah Morning News for a parade of a black infantry battalion from downtown to Lincoln Park with a picnic, dancing and refreshments. This advertisement is from the Savannah Morning News in 1902, and it notes that the streetcars leave from downtown every 20 minutes to Lincoln Park. This is Crawford Square. This is the only one of Savannah's historic squares with an athletic court. In 1946, Savannah's black youth were still playing neighborhood games on dirt courts. No courts in the black playgrounds were paved. That year, the city of Savannah held a tournament of men's teams from four parks in black neighborhoods, Crawford Square, Can Park, Yamacraw Village, and Soldiers Field. The prize was a paved basketball court. The city would build an asphalt court for only one black neighborhood. The team from Crawford Square won the prize and an asphalt court was ready the next year. This court on Savannah's east side became the testing ground for black youth from all over the city who aspired to play in college or the pros. Decades later, some of those who played on Crawford Square paid to erect a plaque marking the victory of the team known informally as the Jets. The city of Savannah opened its first swimming pool in 1921 and it too was segregated. This is a picture postcard based on a photograph of the new swimming area in Daffin Park Lake. It had a bathhouse and a pavilion and a diving platform more than 400 feet long. Meantime, black children swam mostly in the Ogeechee Canal on the west side. The Savannah Tribune noted that black tax dollars helped pay for the Daffin Park pool, but black people were not allowed in 
and they had no comparable facility. Within a week, Mayor Murray Stewart promised a pool for black residents would open the following year. Black residents of the Cannes Park neighborhood wanted the pool in their community. They filed this petition with the city council and they noted that people at the pool would not cause trouble because there would be no intermingling of the races. Notably, the black petitioners did not seek integration of the Daffin Park pool, but they requested comparable facilities. Integration was not a widespread cause in Savannah's black community in the early 20th century. This perspective would change with more activist black leadership starting in the 1940s, especially when the Reverend Ralph Mark Gilbert became the president of the Savannah NAACP chapter. Now, uh, in reaction to the request by black residents of Can Park, white residents also petitioned the council. They declared, we believe that building a pool for Negroes would prove most objectionable. And remember, this is the language of the time. It, it, it uh, is surely offensive in the modern day, but this is the language of the documents and of the people speaking of that time. This kind of push and pull turned up in another neighborhood where black and white citizens live close to one another. Residents fought over whether the playground in Dixon Park should be officially declared for use by black children. The first municipal black swimming pool was in the former Odichi Canal Basin near Louisville Road, close to Stiles Avenue. Within two years, the dressing rooms had burned down and the pool was closed and fell into disrepair. There is no record that it ever reopened. Now, in 1932, the city got a small New Deal grant to build a pool for black people on Ogeechee Road near Laurel Grove South Cemetery. This was actually called on the blueprints, the Recreation Park for Colored People. The project was apparently a bit of political patronage from the democratic political machine led by Johnny Bowen. It included playgrounds and tennis courts. This was the first recreation center in Savannah, the first municipal center for black people. And it's the forerunner of the current Tompkins Community Center. The facility was rebuilt with a new pool in 1956, but following the pattern, this project was undertaken only after a modern pool for whites replaced the swimming lake at Daffin Park. Most direct action protests in 1960 Savannah were aimed at downtown lunch counters and department stores. However, in 1962, the local NAACP president, W.W. W. Law and others called for a boycott of Savannah White Sox games until the city integrated the grandstands at Grayson Stadium. Black fans were segregated in a grandstand in left field, as you can see in this blueprint. The protesters distributed this poster urging black people not to go to Grayson Stadium. The Savannah White Sox team is unfair to its Negro players and fans. The poster says the colored restroom is a common unsanitary outhouse. Black fans stayed away during the boycott and average attendance for White Sox games fell to 850. That's W.W. Law on the left in this photograph. The White Sox franchise tried to retaliate against Law. He was a letter carrier. So they demanded that the U.S. Post Office investigate whether Law's activism violated postal regulations. The White Sox moved the last eight games of their season to Lynchburg, Virginia, and they eventually relocated permanently. Minor League Baseball didn't return to Savannah and Grayson Stadium until 1968 with the Savannah Senators. As a result of the Civil Rights Act in 1964, the grandstands were integrated. The Park and Tree Commission also ran Savannah's municipal cemeteries. The city established Laurel Grove in 1852 and divided it by race. 
When the cemetery opened, an ordinance threatened a fine for any white person who tampered with the monuments, horticulture, or fixtures. But black people, guilty of the same offense, were also subject to a beating. Laurel Grove's northern section was reserved for whites. It was carefully laid out and tended. The graves of rebel soldiers became shrines to the Confederacy. City officials said white residents were uneasy about blacks even stepping on the cemetery's white section for any reason. The Parks Commission minutes of October 6, 1919 state that the keeper of Laurel Grove North issued a rule allowing, quote, no Negroes to enter because certain ladies felt intimidated by black lot caretakers. At the same meeting, the commission considered the letter from Ms. M.J. Stiles asking permission for her old black servant to continue caring for a plot in the white portion. The committee approved, but only on the condition that she supply a photograph of the black caretaker. Laurel Grove South grew haphazardly and early burial locations were poorly documented. The city generally neglected the upkeep of the black section of the cemetery for about a century. In June 1956, the Savannah Tribune called Laurel Grove snake ridden and its condition deplorable. Now, as we see in these minutes of a Park and Tree Commission hearing in April 1959, the mayor, W. Lee Mingeldorf, confronts the commission and complains there was no list or map with the identity and location of each person buried in Laurel Grove South. The meeting was called for just this topic. We don't know how this issue came up, how Mingeldorf's complaint came about. Maybe a complaint from a constituent from the NAACP chapter, or maybe a concern about the upcoming elections in 1960. We don't know. A commission member was appointed to start compiling the records. The mayor told him to hire whatever help he needed. But at the same meeting, as we see at the bottom of these minutes, the Parks Commission noted that there were still open sewers running through Laurel Grove South. And the commission asked the mayor if he planned to do anything about it, because that was the job of the Public Works Department, not the Park and Tree Commission. In the early 1970s, the NAACP chapter led by Mr. Law undertook to rehabilitate Laurel Grove South themselves. In 1906, Mayor Herman Myers boasted that the city separated the black and white sections of Laurel Grove by a barbed wire fence, making the black and white connections separate, breaking the connection between the two and making each one distinctive. In 1967, as we see here, the black and white sections were severed completely by a new Interstate 16 exit. The city golf course, Bacon Park, was especially problematic because it was the only municipal golf course. There was no municipal course for black golfers. It was open to blacks in the days of Jim Crow for only a half day a week on what the golf course operator, operators called Caddy's Day on Mondays. In June 1959, black residents demanded unsuccessfully that the course be open to them for two full days each week. And a few days later, 11 African Americans tried to play at Bacon Park on a Sunday and they were turned away. Here is a Savannah Morning News story covering this event. The uh, group of African Americans left and threatened a federal lawsuit. Mayor Mingeldorf threatened to close the golf course completely in response. In March 1960, high school and college students began the sit-ins at a downtown Savannah lunch counter. Black shoppers boycotted white-owned businesses for more than a year. This began the process of gradual desegregation in Savannah. In July of 1960, 23 African Americans led by the NAACP voting rights activist, the Reverend Pickens Patterson of Butler Presbyterian Church, 
petitioned the Recreation Commission to desegregate Forsyth Park, Daffin Park, Grayson Stadium, and the Municipal Auditorium. The commission desegregated the Bacon Park course in 1961 in March. The city had already ignored many federal court decisions mandating at least separate but equal recreational facilities for black people. Of course, again, Bacon Park was the only municipal course. Mayor Malcolm McLean at that time also appointed a black member, the Reverend Oliver W. Holmes, to the Bacon Park Commission. In late 1961, the city, under repeated threats of federal lawsuits by black residents, declared all municipal recreation sites open to everyone. This was a tacit admission that parks had been informally segregated for a century. But a few months before, police arrested seven black men who were playing basketball in Daffin Park. A judge convicted them of breaching the peace. After losing appeals in state court, the six remaining defendants represented by the NAACP got a hearing from the US Supreme Court. And we have uh, some audio recordings of the oral arguments in the case because the, the Supreme Court is a matter of course made audio recordings. This is from November 1962. And first, we're going to hear the Chatham County Assistant District Attorney Sylvan Garfunkel arguing about why the defendants were in fact breaching the peace and the convictions should be upheld. We were not charging them with doing something unlawful, Your Honor. We were charging them with going upon the park for the purpose of disturbing the peace. And in a, it was a public park. That is correct, sir. Didn't but they, they, you admitted that they had the right to go there? The, they Didn't have you? The, I they, thought your opening no, statement they, was that we, they had the right to go to that park. No, we said they have, the, if, they, if this arrest was used for the purpose of preserving segregation in the park, we say that it shouldn't be reversed. We further well, say... Well, you mean that, uh, that uh, although you admit that, that uh, you don't admit that a Negro had a right to go on that court? No, I, ad I ad the Negro had a right to go on that court, but not for the purpose which they went on. In other words, they went on to see if the, what would happen. They went on to see if they could play. We were not... We were not... And here is the attorney representing the defendants. This is James Nabrit of the National NAACP. These were the first Negroes to play on this basketball court. There was some evidence that some young children had fished in Daffin Park, but all the witnesses agreed these were the first, no, no colored children had played basketball here. As I understand the state's argument, it is that a Negro is welcome in this park and has a right to play there, but he doesn't have a right to come there for the purpose of finding out if that's so. In any event, this is a segregated park to me where the only Negroes who, a segregated basketball court where the only Negroes who go there get arrested. These were the... On May 20th, 1963, the U.S. Supreme Court overturned the convictions. In a unanimous decision written by Chief Justice Earl Warren, who you heard asking questions on these recordings, the court noted that the park was customarily only used by white people and found that the two officers arrested the men on, upon their intention to enforce racial discrimination in the park, which would be a violation of the 14th Amendment. The Supreme Court decision should have swept away customary segregation in Savannah Parks for good. However, authorities continued to bar black swimmers from the Daffin Pool. As in many other cities, Savannah officials were especially resistant to integrating swimming pools. Only after President Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act on July 2nd, 1964, did the Daffin Pool open to everyone. I invite you to take a, a deeper look at my research on the digital exhibit, which will be linked from the City of Savannah website. Uh, here are some sample pages. In 
And the documents that I've used are just a small sample of the resources available at the City of Savannah Municipal Archives. Thank you for watching. Thank you so much, Jeff. That was um, really very interesting to kind of get that um, that dive in um, to your project and research. Um, I think, you know, this is a topic that we don't talk a lot about when we talk about uh, segregation, integration, Savannah. We kind of tend to focus on the Broughton Street boycotts and the mass meetings on Sundays at the churches and the integration, the, the long fight for integrating the public schools. Um, what sort of fascinates me about the parks and the recreational facilities is they were throughout our community because there are parks and recreational facilities throughout Savannah at that time. Um, but also it's for many of our youth, it's the first experience they had with uh, experiencing racism um, and and being um, discriminated against. So, you know, the youngest child was impacted by this, um, whether they were barred from being in a park or even a white child, you know, wanted to play with a black child and they, you know, you know maybe their parent was like, mm, that, that child's not allowed in this park. So it's really a, a first direct experience. Um, I have to say, you know, the hearing the voices from the Supreme Court arguments is really powerful um, to hear hear that. So I uh, thank you for including that. I mean, when you hear somebody saying, you know, the the Chatham County uh, attorney saying they went to see if they could play. Well, <laughs> you know, yeah. that, that's really powerful. But of course, they went to see if they could play. Um, yes. So, you know, um, I'm curious. Is there um, were there things that you wished that if you had more time, what were some areas that you would like to know more about? I think that, uh, you know, WW Law's archive is, is huge and I only scraped the surface of his papers and I'm sure there's more to learn about the real time contemporaneous reaction of the black community to the impact of Jim Crow, not just in parks, but more broadly in the community. Um, I'd like to know more about, uh, perhaps about the, the, the raw politics involved in deciding who would get to use parks and where parks would be built and why the the city was consistently so slow to meet the needs of black taxpayers. Yeah, I think it's interesting looking at the list of the current parks today would be interesting to look at that compared to how the parks developed. Um, you know, hearing about the the contest for the paving and um, of the park. Now we know why. Crawford Square and that basketball court are so important to so many people. Um, they fought hard for it. And so it's, it is the only recreational uh, square out of our 24 squares and um, it's important to the community. Um, well, I really appreciate it. And I look forward to sharing the website with everyone. And I want to thank you for joining us today to um, help tell us about it. Thank you very thank much. You very it, was much. My, it was my pleasure. Thank you.